Hello there everybody and welcome back to episode 9 of my tutorial series for RimWorld version 1.5. Today we're going to talk about advanced defense designs for your bases, winter gameplay and if possible prisoners. I don't know if Lissa will be will be con is, is convincible to turn herself into prisoner for study, but uh, we'll see about that. She is a good shooter, she is a good crafter, she is unable to do a couple of other things, but uh, it's always worth checking out how good the people are, and that is good material to be recruited. So we're going to get started first off with drafting or dudes, and fighting back the attack at hand. So, Lissa is an immediate attacker, that means she doesn't uh, waste any time whatsoever. And here we're going to use a nifty little old trick. So Menino will go in here. I really need to build up a barricade. That is uh, really bad right now. Our defense spot needs a barricade. But we'll be getting there in a second. So we're uh, now using a nifty old trick. Oh, I can't do this because uh, she's not going to go into melee. Oh well. So Menino will stick to her. And with melee uh, on, you can just put somebody with a gun into melee and then they will use their gun as a melee weapon and that is always the worst deal. But uh, yeah, since Menino is in, not capable of violence, there is a really low chance when they bump into each other that the invader is picking up the fight with their melee options, but in this case this wasn't. No matter what, we got no prisoner, but we got an auto pistol. That is really, really good. This is another gun, one gun more than we got people. This is always an amazing uh, situation to be in. Auto pistols are firing faster, longer, or, or on a higher distance than revolvers, but they have less punch through and less damage per bullet. So it's a lower caliber, therefore it has a little bit more um, range and accuracy. Anyways, so we already saw here problems with our design. Our shooters don't have any cover, and that is a bad thing. So if Lissa, or what's her name right, would have had a better chance to fight us, that would have went out way worse for us. So first things first, I need to deconstruct this piece of wall here, as it is really not not good for us. So we're going to remove that. We're also going to take away that piece of rock here. And what we want is a free clear site into this direction. And we're going to set up security wise a barricade. Try to make these barricades if possible out of stone as these will last way uh, longer than regular barricades. So we're going to set that up like here. This is again a very basic setup. So you can en enhance that. By doing this. So we're now putting a piece of wall between each piece of barricade. This allows our people to stand behind the wall, shoot behind cover here, and being protected by the barricade themselves. This is pretty much one of the most uh, powerful ways of protecting yourself from enemy gunfire. It is also a little bit cheesy, but well, I am here to show you the cheese after all. So, we also have a ton of things that we need to haul, and we need to take care of the hypothermia management for our dudes after all. This is really important, especially for your builders, as they tend to do really st crappy crappy stuff if you don't uh, pay attention to that. So. To get rid of that problem, we need jackets. Sadly, we don't have any materials to make jackets out of. So you see, the first winters are always uh, sort of the worst. Oh, we should absolutely forbid sewing now. It's winter. Your colonists sometimes do just very dumb things, like, for example, sewing potatoes and the break of winter. You just have to uh, take care that they don't accidentally... Um, 
forget them in the next uh, in the next spring season. That's a little bit annoying, but uh, it is necessary. Okay, so things in winter go down slower. That is a given. You you have to just to live with that annoying fact. We're going to replace the walls like there. So we're widening that corridor so we can fight back the enemy at that point. All people will be in cover. The enemy will be running in a really cr through a really crappy situation here. But we ain't done here. We can do even more shenanigans there. So first off, we're going to reinstall that trap here. And I think I need to wait until that is done. Ah, oh, well, we're going to make it like that. Saving Bunny. So we have a quest now that I'm not going to do. <laughs> So we are going to expand the devilry here. So I think this should suffice. Oh no, that is wrong, sorry. So we're, uh, I, I mistook that, my bad. So forget what I drew before, we're going to be doing it like this. So what I'm trying to construct here is a corridor that will force the enemy to walk through traps that is really annoying to deal with and it is super powerful at the same time so we're going to make it like this and then we're going to make it like that all right so I think this abomination should suffice. So the trick here goes like that. We're putting barricades like here. You can expand on that design as far as you want to. And the traps go here. So what will happen here in that situation is the raiders, they will only go over barricades if they really, 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 really have to. And traps are considered as a hidden thing in the first place for the game. So technically, the raiders don't even see that there is a trap. So I think you can add up what happens. They'll spring every single trap along the way. This defense system is nice, but it has its drawbacks. First off, it is a hell of a work to get it done and loaded and all because you see you have to replace all of these traps every single freaking time you have sprung those traps. At some point you will realize that sometimes enemies that aren't even worth your traps will be springing these traps and then things start to get a wee bit annoying. So this is in so far a necessary evil unless you build this corridor as an optional entrance that you only open up when you want to but this is really really finicky to do so my personal go-to method here is to have a corridor like this in the early game and then evaluate if it is still necessary or not later down the road so you see that Conway is constantly um, going on breakdowns here, or, or, or he's really close to. So major break risks are nothing to to, uh, to take not serious, to take too lightly. Your people will risk their lives if they have a breakdown at the wrong moment at the wrong, wrong time. So that is really really annoying and should be taken care of. So. This design here is a very, very low quality um, kill box um, primer. People refer to kill boxes in this game as situate as a corridor where your enemies have to walk through, and your dudes are at a very massive advantage while the enemy is at a massive disadvantage. Here we have the small version of that, so to speak where you can put your shooters, one, two, three, four, five of them, into very, very advantageous spots, whereas the enemy is going slowed here. What is bad about this is, this is a very low distance between this and that. Technically, one uh, raider armed with a sniper rifle would be clogging up this place and stay in this position here. Very hard to kill, so that's what I say with it ain't, it ain't ideal. 
every defense system will have though some sort of a weakness and i can only say if you want to have really really powerful kill box designs i recommend watching an entire um video about that i think sir francis bacon did a really really good one in my opinion but i personally that's my personal verdict never go further down the road with a kill box design like that so to finish it up you would be garnering this with uh, gun turrets left and right that the enemy will be shot at from the flanks while you do shoot from the front and a real good one would be made up in a fashion that you maintain a better distance and you can also get more cover by using a half circle for this uh, emplacement but you know why I don't use the extensive, super luxurious, powerful kill box design? Because you don't need to 90% of the time. Unless you are playing on super massive high difficulty levels, this is just overkill and will make the game quite boring if you are just uh, turtling up yourself that hard and no battle will be ever a, uh, a problem. But I also have to say, Never underestimate the power of your storyteller. The AI storyteller in this game is a real fearsome menace to society and they are really really good at messing up your day at a uh, regular basis. Especially drop pod raiders will always be a risk. That's why you see all those uh, little traps that I have distributed in my bases. I usually also run on um, defense turrets inside my bases when I can't afford them. These are technically pea shooters. I'm going to show you here because we're so far away from researching them. Technically they are pretty much pea shooters. Their damage is very low. They have only two shots per burst. Their accuracy is mediocre but what they really do is focus the attention of the enemy really darn good. So you should look at it like that. Every time an enemy is not shooting at your colonists, but instead shooting at one of your buildings that happens to be able to shoot at the enemy as well, you don't risk any permanent injuries on your dudes. That is really something. RimWorld is harsh when it comes down to combat. And the best combat is the one that didn't uh, inflict a single injury on one of your dudes. You always have to weigh, weigh off of, of course, do you want to invest that many resources into a battle or not? But uh, all in all, I, I I can't repeat only myself. It is absolutely better to to invest resources and avoid an injury on your dudes versus invest no resources and risk the loss of a leg, an eye, an arm. You know, these people they can lose basically everything on their body, and you pay the price for that. You, you dudes then need prosthetics, or they are severely downgraded, down to the point uh, that they can be outright completely crippled and uh, useless for the rest of their lives. Speaking about things here, in the current situation... Thank you, game. What a good sense of humor. Um, in the current situation, you have to monitor your constructors extremely closely. If you ever run into a winter situation where you only have heaters but no clothing for your people, you are fine. You will survive the winter just right, but you have to take care that your miners and your constructors, you have to monitor their hypothermia because they tend to do a thing that is really annoying. If there is a construction job out there that has a ton of work units on it, then your people can sometimes forget the fact that they are accumulating too much hypothermia and then they are getting frostbites. I've had that many, many a times and it is a thing, so... It really pays off to have a, uh, a good eye on your hypothermia levels on your dudes in these times. So, once that whole setup will be finished, we're really, 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 really good to go for a darned long time as we now have a pretty powerful defense system going on for ourselves. All right, Furious is right now researching, but we still have the problem at hand that our winter situation is really, really out of hand. 
you should always try to focus into the construction of as many heaters as you can as long as you have the steel, the power and the components to do so. But as we have plenty of components that we can gather here, I um, got, where are they now? These, boy, these boys. You can deconstruct them and they yield steel and components. So there's plenty of them spread around the map. You might ask yourself why I'm not deconstructing them and doing that. So components are quite valuable. And I already mentioned that the storyteller is measuring the severity of their attacks also by your wealth. The amount of time that has passed since the beginning of your game on that specific tile, like the lifetime of that colony, also plays a really big role. But accumulating much wealth for no good reason at all is one surefire way to get yourself into really, really big, big trouble. So that's why I'm avoiding it. Raiders will never attack ship chunks. They don't suffer decay. They don't suffer anything. They're just around for you until you decide to pick them up. So in case you were wondering, I've had that question a couple of times why I never deconstruct them preemptively. As the last thing that I want to say about it, it is really worth banking on these as they work like a mining site, the higher the construction skill of the person deconstructing them, the higher the yield. So that's another reason just to lay back on, on farming these. Anyways, uh, Conway, you will finish that piece of wall. Sometimes you people are like that, putting down the work when they're almost done. I don't like it. Okay, so to get the rest of the situation under control, we're going to get Furious away from his lazy job and try if we can chain shotgun, uh, shotgun something down in or vicinity. Winter is always a good time in the year to go hunting and Furious is absolutely useless in terms of shooting. Why am I sending him then uh, off, you might ask yourself. Because chain shotguns are very, very forgiving if you are a crappy shooter. This is an excellent way of training your crappy shooters. Just move them up close with a chain shotgun and go crazy. This also does yield us the plain leather that we require for the jackets that we need. So this is a really, really nice way of getting the job done. Ooh, a transport crash. So here we have a enemy that we can capture. I don't know if this is uh, going to work for us though, as this is a very uh, prickly situation. Usually, you can really easily just uh, capture these dudes and uh, and put them into the prison. But since it is right now winter, we have the problem that this person out there is really much not um, treatable on the spot. So we have to take a couple of things into account. First off, we only have 13 hours to carry that guy into our prison. And the second thing is the dude carrying the person is not allowed to freeze to death. So if you ever have the problem that the outdoors temperatures are too punishing, it's better to let them die like that. Here goes the same rule of thumb, the colder, the faster the hypothermia kicks in. By the way, I was uh, the, there was that birthday uh, thing that I skipped on. Whenever you see the birthday, birthday uh, mark lighten up, that means that somebody grew older and has now a permanent uh, injury of sorts. So we're going to tend to that guy. So Menino developed cataracts so that is making her eye efficiency worse so well sh since she's not a shooter this ain't a big deal on her but uh well it could be so let's see we successfully have our first prisoner lovely so let's see we can now do all manner of horrible things to our prisoners this is a, uh, a element of RimWorld that is uh, really um, well known and uh, infamous, but uh, well, here goes. First and foremost, we can now, or we need now, to have somebody on wardening duty. You should always try to get the most uh, 
talented social person on priority one. And if you want to recruit them, it is really important that it's really only being done by the most talented person. So we can now start recruiting that person. So you should only do that with people that you actually want to keep. So Atkins is a decent fighter, artist, miner, and animal keeper. Also happens to be a psychopath, which can be a really, really nifty little trait. So no permanent injuries except for a, for a scar, which is, wow, very, very painful. But yeah, I think this is a person that we're going to try to keep. Sometimes people can't be recruited. That is when there is no, uh, when th th this would show up here. So how this works now is we now send one of our dudes every now and then. They can talk to them and try to recruit them. And once the resistance is broken, they will be recruited. End of the story. And that is another fun thing about winter. Sometimes the animals decide to hunt your dudes. So since the grizzly bear is a hungry, hungry uh, chunker, he's now going to go into our base and try to find some food there. So these are situations that you totally need to take serious as they can be absolutely devastating if they, if they hit you um, unprepared. But we are prepared. And we're going to skitter into our emplacements while the grizzly bear is walking up there. And Meninyu gets the un... So this is really, really nasty. As you see there, the grizzly bear is now marked as non-hostile. Which is bollocks, because he is gosh darn hostile. So... This is a very, very dangerous situation. This is uh, a very nasty behavior of RimWorld. Manhunters, they don't get automatically attacked. Because once they lose line of sight, they behave as if they are not hunting your dude. But they will go to the location of the dude that they were hunting, and then they will go on aggressive again. That will trigger the automatic response of your guys way too late. By the way, there is another thing that you can do here in the assign menu, and I highly recommend you to change their behavior to attack as a default. You can then hold down the left mouse button and drag and drop to copy that. Meninio obviously can't do that because he is a non-violent person. So yeah. Predator attacks, so you now ha know how to handle them. You will still lose people to them because they can happen pretty much out of nowhere. The best way to deal with that is just to kill those guys before they start hunting your guys. It's a foolproof concept, but yeah. So, your prisoners need gear. Now to the other things that you can do. There are operations. You can harvest their organs. This is massive as you can gain organs that you can use for your own people that is also something that you can sell off on any occasion it also has a heavy tax on the moral on the morale of your dudes because people hate the 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 immoral uh, way of life there so you will have severe punishments on your on your mood unless People are psychopaths. So if you want to do a really messed up run where you do art orgist, uh, organ harvesting on a larger scale, psychopaths are way to go. So, of course, this goes to say if you harvest both lungs, they dead. If you harvest both kidneys, they dead. Same goes for the heart. And you see, it is a pretty straightforward thing. You can also do all manner of messed up things with him. You see, you can also replace body parts with uh, prosthetics. You will always get displayed here the uh, available prosthetics, but most importantly you can also administer any type of drug that you have available via this menu. The operations menu is also available for any of your pawns, and as you see here you have the same options, but on prisoners the situation is a little bit less impactful for your own colony. So prisoners can also be, I don't know, slavery already here as a 
thing or do we need to do that on I think I forgot but I think enslavement is a thing of that you only have if you have um ideology DLC activated I think this is uh, because it should show up here if possible so with ideology DLC you can also enslave people and let them work for you while they stay prisoners so here we don't have that option obviously anyways so we're making progress we have dead animals in our freezer but we also need to put the cook on duty for that so shield is on its uh, way but we're going to prioritize the butchering all right so winter grows easier and easier the longer you you play your colony at some point it will be a triviality a real non-factor but you have to reach that point obviously first it doesn't happen on its own so we're going to make our first jacket now right from uh, uh, from the bed whoa, 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 whoa my dude did I forbid cloth? I... I would... I could swear I did forbid cloth. Well, alright. So, yeah, we uh, we used up some of our cloth for that, but, uh, well... I need to let Conway go off of that job, as it is in the dead of the night, and uh, he really needs to sleep soon. Crazy dude still does deliver some things on the uh, night work site, but uh, yeah. All right. So once that thing here is done, we are able to call this a finished setup. So we're going to leave this miniature um, kill box like that. So I'll I'm walling off this here, so the enemy can still flow into this direction. It also allows you to consider. However you want to build further from that point on, you can, you can build your fortification systems as big or small as you want to. I just wanted to introduce the whole kill box idea to you here. So one last thing that I want to introduce to you, which has been, which has proven itself invaluable to me over time, is a setup like this. Having a small chamber like that prepped up is sometimes massive so the idea is you let the enemy pour inside here and you hide your melee pawns inside there sometimes enemies have weapons that you just don't want to see fired grenade launchers rocket launchers all of those things so hiding a couple of melee dudes in here until the dangerous enemy has popped in goes like this. You wait until the enemy in question pours in, they will always go somewhere where they will prime up their gun and fire at first. This is the point where you will just swarm out and kill the guy in question. This is a pretty foolproof way that I personally have had much success with. Another thing that I deeply recommend or warmly recommend is having two doors here. You can set your doors to be held open permanently. And so, what's this all about? You set up these doors to be held up permanently, because otherwise your base will be counted as sealed off from the storyteller. But if these are marked as hold open permanently, your base is open. You can then disable it again, and then you can seal off your base. This is super effective against Manhunter attacks, because Manhunters never attack your fortifications. That is just not in their script. So I've done it several times in the past when I've been facing a Manhunter pack of, I don't know, 20 Grizzlies or, or I don't know, stuff that you just don't want to fight in that numbers. You just close these two doors, then you're good to go. You, you, are, you saved yourself. The Manhunter attacks will disperse after a couple of days they will just wander off the map or die off of the Scaria that they have on themselves because that kills after five days, if I remember correctly. So this double door system is now your, you can consider it just as your Manhunter um, safety protocol, sort of. All right, so you now know like pretty much everything you need to know about base defense. 
to be quite happy. The only thing that we haven't uh, implemented here is a proper choke point of sorts. So we definitely need that as well, but I think I will explain that when I'm talking about infestations. So infestations, just as a heads up, can spawn everywhere where you have mined yourself into a mountain. Infestations are super strong insectoids that will mess up your day brutally and they are just spawning wherever they want to and are infamous for being a really, really massive pain in the rear. I'm going to explain how to beat them there because choke points are absolutely vital. To just let you know what I'm talking about, sometimes you just want a narrow spot where you can funnel one enemy at a time. Basically, you already have one choke point, so if enemies ever come as a melee-only combo, you would put three pawns in front of here. I'm showing you here like I mean it. Three people, like here. And then you can put your shooters right behind your melee guys here. If they are standing right behind there, they will never trigger friendly fire. That's a little trick. And this uh, setup can be copied anywhere. You just set up three melee guys, heavy armor, good weapons, and then you put people right behind them to shoot behind that. That little phalanx formation is super strong. You just have to keep a backup fighter. So you have one or two maybe here as backup to fill up the front line because if one of them gets downed, you immediately have to replace the, the, the gap. But it is a super strong uh, strategy. And yeah, that's, that's all I have to share for now. Infestations and mechanoid attacks mechanoid clusters specifically, are so much of their own topic that I'm going to dedicate entire episodes to that. So stay tuned. That's the end of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed. We're going to continue next time when we're going to go over the rest of this uh, Godforsaken winter. And I hope you guys will tune on in again. Leave me your comments down below. Leave me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. And of course, Check out the description box. There's so much stuff down there that you might want to see. And yeah, I'd be really happy if you guys be there. There is also, whoa, serious hypothermia happening. <laughs> yeah. There's also a couple of links down there that you might want to see. There's Discord, there's Twitch, there is uh, also... Why are you going hypothermic here, damn it. Um, <laughs> It's also my Patreon, my Paypal, and buy me a coffee hanging out for you. And be so kind, check them out. Big, big thanks to all the supporters of Icon Gaming. I have to manage hypothermic people here. See you guys next time.